the global community of educators. Are you an educator who finds it difficult to engage the Gen Z learner? Are you finding it a challenge to make full use of technology for teaching and learning? Are you of the belief that good instructional design means that we need to upload text and presentation materials, videos and quizzes onto a learning management system? Or are you still teaching all your classes using video conferencing systems? If so, then Freeju is the place you should be at. Freeju is a community of educators by educators. Here, you can network with educators from all around the world, collaborate on projects, exchange ideas, access the best competency-based professional development courses which help you enhance your pedagogical and technical skills as a 21st century educator. Learn to use digital tools which enable you to design your lessons easily and quickly and so much more. Join more than 100,000 educators from more than 35 countries and get access to a wide variety of competency-based professional development courses which you can complete at your own time and at your own pace. What's more, the courses are available in several different languages and come with CPD units and certificates. No matter if you teach children at a preschool or an elementary level or at a high school or tertiary education level, even if you are a corporate trainer training adults, we have professional development courses for you. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for early access to Freeju version 2 today at acatasia.com and get in queue to receive a free lifetime membership for Freeju. What's more, if you sign up today, you will even receive access to 10 professional development programs for free. Sign up today. Visit www.acatasia.com and join Freeju, the global community of educators. Welcome to Freeju, the global community of educators. Are you an educator who finds it difficult to engage the Gen Z learner? Are you finding it a challenge to make full use of technology for teaching and learning? Are you of the belief that good instructional design means that we need to upload text and presentation materials, videos and quizzes onto a learning management system? Or are you still teaching all your classes using video conferencing systems? If so, then Freeju is the place you should be at. Freeju is a community of educators by educators. Here, you can network with educators from all around the world, collaborate on projects, exchange ideas, access the best competency-based professional development courses which help you enhance your pedagogical and technical skills as a 21st century educator. Learn to use digital tools which enable you to design your lessons easily and quickly and so much more. Join more than 100,000 educators from more than 35 countries and get access to a wide variety of competency-based professional development courses which you can complete at your own time and at your own pace. What's more, the courses are available in several different languages and come with CPD units and certificates. No matter if you teach children at a preschool or an elementary level or at a high school or tertiary education level, even if you are a corporate trainer training adults, we have professional development courses for you. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for early access to Freeju version 2 today at acatasia.com and get in queue to receive a free lifetime membership for Freeju. What's more, if you sign up today, you will even receive access to 10 professional development programs for free. Sign up today. Visit www.acatasia.com and join Freeju, the global community of educators. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you are. Um, it is uh, so good to see all of you here today. Uh, and welcome once again to uh, 
our continuing series of virtual fireside chats that we've been hosting here uh, since the last two, two and a half months now. Uh, today is uh, the second fireside chat uh, under the theme of teachers as um, lifelong learners. Uh, today's topic is, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the power of international linkages to improve your own teaching uh, and learning practices. And uh, we've got an amazing um, uh, panel of guests for you. Um, before that, uh, please allow me to introduce myself. Uh, I am Nilesh. Uh, I am the CEO and the co-founder of ACAD Asia, uh, and I am based out of Singapore. And uh, uh, we um, have uh, basically been working over the last couple of years to find ways and means to help and empower educators everywhere. Uh, and once again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, without much ado, let me get right to introducing uh, all of you to the panelists uh, today. Um, our first panelist is uh, Dr. Tirso uh, Ronquillo, uh, who is uh, the president of uh, Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges. And he's also the president of Batangas State Universities. He's an academic leader and manager, an established researcher, an innovator, an advocate of disaster risk management, an ASEAN engineer, and a full-fledged professor, armed with a master's degree in electronics engineering and doctorate degree in management. Uh, Dr. Tirso was appointed president of Batanga State University in July 2014 and was unanimously reappointed for a second term uh, in 2018. Uh, Bat State is the only state university in the country whose engineering and information technology programs are accredited by the U.S. Acc uh, acc accrediting board for engineering and technology. Um, he's also the member of Australasian Association for Engineering Education, American Society for um, Engineering Education, and Institute of Electrical and Electronics uh, Engineers. He's also an evaluator of the Engineering Accreditation Commission of the Philippines Technological Council and the recipient of the Presidential Award of Recognition and Outstanding Faculty of the Year in 2011 and 2005, respectively. In July 2019, uh, Dr. Tirso was re-elected as President of the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges, or PASUK, uh, thus leading all presidents of state-governed higher education institutions in the country in strategic planning and policy formulation. Thank you, uh, Sir Tirso. We are so uh, happy and honored to have you here today. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank our, you. Next, our next panelist uh, is Dr. Imam Wahyudi Karimullah. He is the head of Office of International Affairs, and he's also the faculty member of Teacher Training and Education Department at the University of Islam Malang, or UNISMA, from Indonesia. Dr. Imam um, is... Uh, the head of Office of International Affairs, and um, he also holds a master's deg uh, degree program in English language teaching and the faculty of teacher training and, um, and education of, um, uh, as well. Uh, he earned his MA in higher adult and lifelong education from Michigan State University, US, mm -hmm. and received his doctoral degree in English language teaching from State University of Malang. Uh, currently, he serves as a coordinator of national and international collaboration Division at the Association of, of Experts and Lecturers of the Republic of Indonesia, East Java Province chapter, with more than 500 higher education institutions and more than 40,000 lecturers. Dr. Karimullah was the National Language Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia and was a recipient of Ambassador Award for Excellence from the Indonesian Ambassador for the US. He had the opportunity to be an Indonesian visiting scholar at Prince of Songkhla University Phuket campus in Thailand, and initiated the establishment of Indonesian Center through the support from the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia in Bangkok. Thank you, Dr. Imam. So very happy to have you here today. Thank you, Neil, for the introduction. Our third and um, uh, uh, final panelist for today is Mr. Andrew Sabara, uh, Sabara Ratnam. He's a Senior Director uh, for Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship from Nian Polytechnic. Uh, Mr. Andrew is an engineer by training and has been uh, in tertiary education for well over 30 years. He's also a certified trainer in cultural intelligence, 
Uh, Mr. Andrew's innate understanding of culture coupled with his global experience allows him to relate and work seamlessly in, in a culturally diverse setting. But uh, not everyone has this uh, natural ability, and so this skill has to be developed. Technology has made education borderless, filling the, the virtual classrooms with teachers and students from diverse cultural backgrounds, and educators need cultural intelligence to relate and work effectively with people from different nationalities, ethnicities, age groups, and more. Mr. Andrew will share his knowledge and experience on how to adapt seamlessly to any culturally diverse situation for more productive outcomes in education. Hi, Andrew, and once again, welcome to this Fireside Chat. We are so thrilled to have you here today. Hi, Nilesh. Thank you for the introduction. Um, before I introduce our moderator, I would also like to uh, share uh, with you that today we have more than 9,400 people who have registered uh, from more than 50 uh, odd countries. Uh, they're coming in from Botswana, Costa Rica, from Philippines. Uh, we have people from Ghana um, and Malaysia and Indonesia and, of course, Singapore. Uh, and uh, we are so very excited to have all of you here today from the various parts of the world. It truly is an international um, uh, fireside chat that we are having today. And of course, I will leave the best for the last. Uh, and with that, let me introduce uh, to all of you, to the moderator uh, for this uh, fireside chat today, Dr. Kirsten Bartels, who is um, our uh, chief academic officer here at ACAD Asia. And uh, as always, uh, she uh, is here to brighten up our afternoon um, with her wonderful smile. And uh, she joins us all the way from Michigan, United States. Kirsten, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It is so nice to meet all of you. I didn't realize, Dr. Iman, that we uh, share a connection in Michigan. I have <laughs> a great many friends who did their undergrad or graduate degrees at Michigan State. Thank you, Dr. Christian. My aunt lives in Ann Arbor, though. Don't hold Michigan. that against me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, for those of you who don't know, there's a huge rivalry in Michigan between Michigan State University and the University of Michigan. Oh. University yes. of Michigan is no located <laughs> in Ann Arbor. I have no allegiance to either or no problem with either one. I'm a Grand Valley <laughs> State person myself. Um, oh, shout out to Tom Haas, who is the former president, who may be watching right now. Anyway. It's interesting because, you know, we talked about internationalism. We've been talking about it for a very long time. And it used to be this, when can we travel? You know, when can we go? When can you come here to Michigan to see me? When can I go to see you? But with COVID, we have really embraced the idea of crossing boundaries and collaborating in a new way of doing things like this. I think it's also showed us more about the importance of networking, of reaching out, of collaborating across all kinds of borders. So I'd like to start today with the simple question of why do you each think that it's important for teachers to be part of a global community? And whoever would like to go first, please. Perhaps uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. Yeah. Please, Andrew. Okay. Uh, I, I think there are two reasons. Uh, first, we are living in a globalized world. And, uh, the, and it's becoming increasingly connected. And, um, you know, we, uh, to succeed today, you need to be able to have a global workforce because they bring in a variety of ideas. They bring in rich ideas. They bring in innovative ideas. That's one. Secondly, you need to go out and make global partnerships with uh, companies in other countries. So if that's happening at a global scale, then it's a high possibility that your students are going to go out into the world and be part of this global community. And as teachers, we need to be, and educators, we need to be culturally competent to equip them and prepare them for that. That's number one. And the second reason I can think of is because of the expansion of online learning, especially with COVID. There's a lot of online learning taking place and, and it's bringing in a, a global classroom of international students. And with that comes cultural diversity. And teachers need to be cultural mediators to, to, to uh, mediate over cultural incompatibilities, to build bridges and, and establish linkages in a classroom setting. So these are two reasons I can think of. Uh, uh, perhaps Dr. Imam or President Tesso can add on to that. Hello. 
Hello, okay. please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, now it's uh, more than before. It's high time really to collaborate to expand our network. You know, divide is only in our mind. In fact, this meeting, we are speaking from different uh, nations maybe, but we just came from a, another Zoom meeting. I have a Zoom meeting with my friends or with my uh, colleagues in the university. It's just the same. We're using the same platform, meaning to say, it's now immaterial, whether we're talking with our neighbors, with our uh, other uh, friends in the same country, it's just the same. When we collaborate, we expand our networks, we expand our resources, and uh, in the first place, we expand friendships. No, it's friendship. No, it's not all about online resources. It's not all about uh, additional resource material. It's on top of that friendship. We expand friendship, our uh, support base. We need more support, especially this time, that we might be able to get more ideas other than our classroom requirements. Once we have established networks, we, you might be uh, part of our support base, even, even our other requirements, even our other necessities in life, maybe even counseling. We can take good counsel from other uh, networks outside. This is now high time for us to collaborate, to network beyond boundaries of nation, beyond boundaries of countries. So that's my first, uh, my first statement, uh, uh, Madam. So thank I will you so much. Uh, Dr. Imam, how about you? Yes, thank you, uh, Christian, for the question. Um, now we have uh, sustainable development goals set by the United Nations, and we plan to achieve in 2030. And one of the sustainable goals that we all together uh, would like to planning to achieve is the quality of education. So remember the the underline is the quality of education. Whatever levels we have, whether um, elementary school, um, high school, or university level, whatever role as a teachers we have, as a teachers or faculty members, uh, the program that has been said by our government, and I believe all governments in all countries, including in Indonesia, Philippines, or in the US, is quality of education. And to achieve the quality of education, as already said by the United Nations, the goal number 17 is international partnership. So international partnership, connecting uh, our institution, ourselves, to a broader community is a very, very important to increase, to develop, to improve the quality of our education, the quality of our teaching skills, the quality of our professionalism in, uh, in teaching, in learning, in our profession. And by having the partnership, by having the network, we can learn from our partners. A couple of weeks ago, we have been uh, we were in the meeting with our partners from the uh, from the uh, European Union as well as from the USAID, uh, United States Agency for International Development in Jakarta. And we have been talking about how to improve the quality of our education through partnership. So it is important for our teachers, what, Apple, what, what kind of levels we have, we need to collaborate with other partners from other universities, from other schools, from other institutions so that we can get best practices so that we can learn from them. Uh, for example, from University of Islam Malang, we have been working closely with more than three, uh, 35 uh, countries and more than 100 uh, universities, schools. And uh, it is interesting for us to know from each other, to learn from each other, what kind of software, for example, that has been used by uh, schools in the United States or in the Philippines, for example, what kind of approach that uh, teachers can use uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So the underline is quality of education is very, very crucial thing at the moment. And to achieve the target of increasing our quality of education, another goal of our sustainable development goals is international partnership. That's Christian. Excellent. Dr. Kirsten, could I Please. add on to uh, Dr. What, Imam, uh, what Dr. Imam said about international partnership? Uh, very important because um, our students are no longer citizens of a country. They are, they are 
citizen, there are new forms of citizenship. They are global citizens. In the internet, they are netizens. And the way they learn today is so different from our time. They learn differently. They pick up knowledge differently. They're picking up skills differently. And unless at the classroom we change the way we do things, they're not going to learn from us. They're going to go out there and learn. And so we need to have this international partnership, as uh, Dr. Imam so rightly said, to learn from others, pick up new uh, pedagogies, uh, pedagogies, new methodologies in teaching, and, uh, and be in tune with how our students learn so that uh, we can enhance that whole learning experience. Thank you so much. And I think you're all absolutely right that, you know, our students today, they're doing things that we never imagined. My son plays video games with his friends from literally all over the world. It's been, I think, 12 years since we lived in the UK. And yet he has maintained these friendships because of his online gaming. And to them, it's not they haven't seen each other in 10 years because they get together once a week. And that's not how we viewed the world. So yeah, there are things that we definitely can learn. And one thing that I think about for some people, the idea of creating international partnerships, creating international friendships, collaborating internationally, that's frightening. Because I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to say something that's going to be offensive, and yet I can't be an expert in absolutely every culture. So there's some th there's certain things that people need to realize when they're starting to do this. And one thing is, what are the great benefits? So will you each please share one of the most impactful lessons that you've learned or experience you've had when you were building your international linkages? Uh, Kristen, uh, you are Please. asking uh, benefits of, of yes. this thing. It's more of benefits, in fact. Uh, we have all the benefits of having these international networks or collaboration. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Iman, it's learning best practice is one. Uh, maybe because of our partnership, we can also uh, learn or determine our parity, how we are at par, really, with the rest of the world. Are we doing things with, which are at par or which may not be outdated anymore? Or we may uh, we should uh, learn because of that, we can learn how to adjust. No? We can learn how to uh, improve. That's, that's one benefit of having these uh, networks. And uh, of course, as I have uh, initially uh, uh, mentioned in my first statement, this expansion of uh, networks really expand our support base they are our support they are our should i say immediate helpline you need not to fly from the philippines to the us they're our immediate helpline uh, they are just now at our fingertips we have so many friends we have so many peers right at our fingertips as far as we have internet we have them our helpline and i hope that uh, this partnership will continue of course uh, maybe when time allows, uh, we can go there. But uh, at the moment, this is the best thing for us to do, to collaborate so that we can have this uh, exchange of partnerships. You know, uh, imagine we are more than a year in our homes, in our respective place, as our classroom. We need somebody to talk to. We need somebody to have uh, some online gaming, maybe sometimes e-drinking, no? and easing in. No? So when we have this, then they're our immediate support uh, support base. And of course, in terms of uh, quality of education, quality of research, the, the benefit is parity. We can determine parity. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I did a lot of online. Um, we did Quarren trivia and stuff. Nobody invited me to do any online singing, though. I think my friends are <laughs> smart enough to know better than do that. Dr. Ma, Dr. Andrew, do you have any personal experiences or benefits that you have from um, your international linkages that you'd like to share? Thank you, Dr. Kristen. So the benefit, I would like to talk from the perspective, uh, personal perspective and from the institutional perspective. So now I, uh, I'm working as the head of Office of International Affairs and our faculty members, we have uh, 10 faculty members, 10 faculties medical faculties, teacher training faculties, uh, law, agriculture, and then uh, natural sciences, medicine, 
all those faculties now in Indonesia in the process of uh, achieving international recognition. And I think uh, whoever we are as a teacher, as, uh, as leaders of organization, leaders of school, school principals, I think and I believe uh, all of us uh, want to be internationally recognized. It means that um, by having international recognition, then we have the quality of education, we have uh, excellent uh, quality of our education. So the most impactful lesson that uh, we have at the University of Islam Malang, when uh, we are working on developing our international partnership, because uh, of course there are more than like a thousand universities in, in the world. I believe more than like uh, hundreds or maybe uh, uh, thousands of universities and schools. And we need to find uh, which partnership that we are going to work with. And I'm talking from the perspective of Indonesia. Now the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Indonesia setting a very important goal, which is called as uh, freedom of campus and the freedom of learning. And in this program, all universities, all schools in Indonesia are pushed, encouraged to have the collaboration with reputable universities, reputable schools, having a high rank uh, position in the world. And in terms of uh, finding the partnership, sometimes uh, we have been working with uh, developed countries and uh, non-developed countries. And in this process, the most important lesson that we have is, of course, there will be diverse, uh, what we call diverse situation that we are uh, facing with, uh, with our international partners. We work with like more advanced universities with uh, good technology. And sometimes we also need to work with those who are in the, what we call, uh, non-privileged uh, areas in this uh, global world. So in this case, the key point is when we are working on international collaboration, then we need to understand uh, the situation of our partners that we are working with. And the transfer, uh, the transfer of uh, best practices in this case is very important so that we can fill the gap uh, uh, among the partnership that we are working on. So the best uh, impactful lesson that I have gained so far in developing the international linkages is uh, we really, really need uh, to, uh, what we call, to, to position ourselves uh, when we are working uh, with institution, organization, offices, so that uh, the target goal together uh, can benefit not only our part but also our partners and 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 it is very important now um, to work on a mutual uh, partnership we need to negotiate what kind of benefits that we can give to our partners and we can get uh, from for our institution so that's a very very important mutual uh, partnership to improve our quality of education is uh, the key thing that uh, we need to be uh, we call pay attention to. Excellent. Thank you so much. Andrew, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes. Um, um, I'd like to add on to what uh, President Tesso said about uh, international linkages and building friendships and relationships. I think that's very important. That's one of the benefits or that's the major benefit of international linkages because when you engage with someone from a different country and you build that friendship and build that relationship, you can talk at a deeper level and you can then talk about collaboration. And because you have that, 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 that um, your connection, um, you can together come up with a lot of interesting ideas that you can do together. You know, in, in Singapore, before COVID, we all, our schools have always had, uh, always invited uh, international lecturers to come on board uh, whether in schools or in tertiary, in tertiary institutions, so that the students will have an, uh, an international flavor. They won't just be teaching from Singapore lecturers, but they'll be hearing from the Philippines, from, the Indo from Indonesia, from Europe, and they will learn different 
teaching styles, they'll pick up different culture, and, and that will widen their 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 whole being. But with online now, it's even better. I mean, look at this platform. We got someone from the Philippines, from Indonesia, from USA, and that's me from Singapore, and we are all together uh, talking on a common topic. Imagine if a teacher could collaborate with someone from another country and bring that teacher online together with her or him uh, and, and teach the students. And the students will have this variety this, this, uh, of teaching uh, ideas and teaching methodologies coming in, and it will just make the whole experience even better. And you know, we all come from different cultures and the way we think and do things are different. And we bring that with us when we teach students. And so it makes the whole experience all the more interesting. Can I add more on and what Andrew said, Dr. Please. Christian? Uh, last two semester, I taught a cross-culture understanding course. What was interesting from my class, uh, I asked my student to present it about the other culture. But uh, the motivation was not really that high. So I was thinking how to increase my student's motivation. And then uh, some of my students, uh, gave me an opinion how if we invite uh, students international students living in Malang or living overseas and then ask them to come and then uh, share their perspective and then from the survey that I I sent to my students uh, it increased their uh, motivation in in joining their class and having interaction asking more questions even uh, after the st uh, the class time was up, they still want to ask questions because uh, they gain more perspective. At that time, we invited a student from Japan, from Russia, from uh, uh, Sudan, and then from the United States of America, and then uh, from um, from Palestine. That's that's interesting. So students more motivated, and then when we also invited. Um, our colleague uh, from Rilo, uh, U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, and then we had the uh, we had the opportunity to get uh, a U.S. A fellow uh, from the U.S. Embassy in, in Jakarta, and we had uh, another perspective uh, from uh, U.S. Uh, teaching uh, ICT-based learning material, and uh, we shared it to our. Um, uh, teachers, alumni, and then faculty members, and they are so happy. So they learn new thing from um, from another uh, another lecturer, another uh, another side of another part of the world, and it's it's motivated the students. Oh, I absolutely agree with you, and it's interesting now we. We didn't think about, hey, I can bring someone in from across the world into my class before. But now with, and I'm not saying there's benefits of COVID, but one thing we have learned is we can have these international linkages. We don't have to be the expert in everything. We can bring in someone That's right. who is an expert. Another thing that I think is great, and we'll see if you agree or disagree, is we realize that we're not alone. That I know when I first joined Academia, they brought up, up that a lot of teachers, especially in the Philippines, talk about you know they have internet issues, and there was the assumption that maybe you know in the states we don't have internet issues, we have internet issues, you know we and so we have the same struggles, and it makes you feel more connected and better because you're not alone. So that's one thing that I've really enjoyed with this whole virtual thing. And my kids still laugh at me. They didn't think that I would ever really embrace the digital world. And now here I am <laughs> loving it. <laughs> and maybe, um, Christian, if you may add. Please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we always think of collaboration of faculty from one university to another university in the country. No? Uh, maybe it would be possible if we can arrange collaboration of our students. Let's say a student of one country, facilitated by by a faculty in one country, to uh, a collaboration of uh, another student group, no, another country. I think that is worth uh, worth uh, exploring. If our students really can uh, can gain that experience 
of collaborating with other students. No, maybe in not the whole class. No, but we can arrange few of them uh, to another smaller group of other class, and let's let's see from there if there would be innovation. You know, you know, students' minds now are thinking uh, a little faster. No, than their teachers. So I think that's worth exploring also at this day. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and there are so many opportunities to do it now. And on Freeju, when we use the, the collaboration part, the collab, I'm hoping that teachers will follow your example and you know really start doing this. I don't know uh, if you watched the this, this special they talked about on the Olympics that, um, and I'm going to forget the details of it. There was a boat that someone lost their boat and it showed up in the States halfway around the world two years later. And these people cleaned it up. It was a fishing boat that a teacher used to teach students how to fish. The people in this very small town in the States found it, cleaned it up, managed to send it back. And since that's happened, they have sent students back and forth between the two countries. And just so, the opportunities they've learned. Sorry, Neil, go ahead. You're, you're anxious to jump in, so please do. <laughs> No, actually, I just wanted to kind of touch upon what uh, uh, Sir Thirso mentioned about, you know, students collaborating. And I think that's a that's a um, wonderful way of looking at linkages. And he's absolutely correct where, you know, we typically look at linkages only from a teacher's perspective or a faculty perspective or, a, or you know, in the case of like, say, um, uh, Pak Imam's, uh, you know, uh, position, you know, the department's perspective. Uh, but the way I look at it is, it is extremely important for us to get our students involved in an international, um, you know, uh, classroom, uh, if, if you could call it that. And that's exactly what we are looking to do now uh, with uh, the version two of Free Jew. Uh, so, in fact, uh, in the next version, what uh, teachers will be able to do is to find, um, you know, uh, other teachers from all around the world who are teaching the same subjects, who are interested in the same topics and build those linkages not just at a department level or not just at a school level but at a classroom to classroom level so imagine a situation where if i am talking about entrepreneurship uh, in singapore um, can i do a joint project with students from batanga state university in the philippines without ever having to leave my home that is the power of what we can actually achieve now with version two of the platform. So I'm so uh, happy that Sir Tirso actually mentioned this because uh, I just wanted to let him know it's coming soon, three weeks away. <laughs> three weeks away. <laughs> could, I, could I say something about international collaboration among students? Please. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we see things through our own cultural lens and, and we sometimes assume others behave the same way as we do. We have our own cultural systems, uh, our cultural beliefs, our cultural norms, our cultural values. And it's very easy to forget that other cultures do not think the same way as we do. So when you get uh, students from another culture coming in, the teacher plays an important role here. The teacher has to be culturally competent. Because what if you have students who are used to taking instructions, and then you've got another group of students who like to be facilitated? What if you have a group of students who need, uh, don't like to, to do collaborative work, whereas you have another group that likes collaborative work? So if you've got two different cultures coming in and you want them to work together, then the teacher who is the cultural mediator must know how to do this balancing. And, and that's why I, I think it's important that uh, in a platform like Akadesia uh, Friju, where you can have, when you can bring in teachers together and learn from one another and understand culture and learn the different types of pedagogies that they use so that when you bring in international students and you know their cultural background you know how to handle them and how to how to get them to collaborate with your students uh, many companies have had great ideas of coming together uh, and uh, because they think that okay there was i think there was a story of uh, uh, daimler and benz coming together to uh, to form a, a consortium but it didn't last long because of cultural differences and uh, what was Claim to be the, the, the most successful business ever was a total flop. So uh, what's important is st students, uh, staff, teachers handling uh, international students must be culturally competent. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I want to follow up with cultural competency in a minute, but I know that Neil has a question that he would like to ask. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kirsten. So I have a, um, a bit of a controversial question here for everybody. 
um, you know, we're talking about international linkages. We're talking about, you know, learning from, um, you know, each other's uh, way of, ways of teaching and, and uh, you know, uh, delivering um, lessons in the classroom. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, countries which pride themselves in the quality of the education that they, that they deliver. Uh, so let me give you an instance. When we look at, say, Finland, a lot of countries actually look at the way, you know, uh, the students in Finland actually learn and how the teachers actually deliver courses. It's a very different way of actually delivering courses uh, and the way they actually approach uh, their enti entire instructional design and their, uh, you know, learning practice. Um, so if I was a teacher, uh, and again, uh, I would urge all the panelists to put yourself in the shoes of a teacher. OK, uh, so you could be a public school teacher, you could be a state university te lecturer or a professor, but put yourselves in their, their shoes. If they are now trying to build a connection with some of these teachers from these countries where they have education systems which are world renowned. How confident do you think um, will should the teachers be that they will be able to replicate that? same system in their own classrooms or in their own schools, number one, or is number two, is it even important for us to look at replicating the system? Because maybe it doesn't work in my country. You know, that system is great in Finland, but if I want to replicate that here in Singapore, it may or may not work. So how does a teacher at that point uh, approach uh, the international partnership, the collaboration, and how do they take that informed judgment call on what to take away and what to leave behind. Yeah. That's a very, very hard question, Daniel. Uh, let me give my perspective uh, from my own perspective. As a teacher or instructor or whatever we call it, our faculty member, the first thing I think is not about the way how we teach. It's not about what kind of model that we are going to use or what kind of model that we are going to replicate from any best universities. But from my own perspective, it is very crucial for us as a teacher, as a lecturer or faculty member to think about what do our students really need right now and in the future. And when we are thinking about uh, students need assessment, so what do they need? Then we are now thinking about um, how the students get what they need. And many of us now, we try to teach our students. I remember a couple of uh, weeks ago, I uh, opened again a book written by John Dewey. Um, experience and education, a very famous book uh, about um, education and how do we transform our education. So it is not a matter of uh, Finland, US, Singapore, Australia, or Philippines or Indonesia. It's more about what our students now need and how we do, how we fulfill their needs. And then we adjust uh, our learning environment based on their context it's based on their need based on what they are comfortable with say for example uh, a teacher of mathematics uh, of high school uh, um, high school a teacher want to teach a mathematic education in his school uh, do we do he need or he she need to replicate the way of teaching from finland depends we do not know so the first thing is how our students learn and how to motivate them to learn uh, i remember what uh, uh, pa, uh, dr uh, tirso mentioned about uh, students engagement so when our students are in comfort zone they are happy to learn then they will learn something so it is important for us to make them happy, to give them the learning opportunity. And doesn't, it doesn't mean that we use one tool and then it fits with all. It doesn't have to be like that. And uh, that's why 
I do strongly believe that Freeju is a very good uh, platform for teachers so that they can engage with um, teachers uh, from the same subject from different countries. And then uh, it can create the student engagement uh, in Indonesia uh, right now at the University of Islam Malang, we have um, student engagement. So we put our students learn uh, by going to the schools, interact, having interaction with uh, schools, uh, students and teachers so that they learn by doing. So they learn from the real uh, world, from the global world. So it's, so it's, it's, it's a very complex uh, thing that we need to consider when uh, we want to adapt or adopt, uh, uh, what, for example, the best system. Uh, there is no guarantee that uh, we adapt a system from, say, for example, this university or this school can work or can be implemented successfully in our context. Uh, but for sure, when students have the interaction with a global community, uh, at least from my research perspective, I did research on that, students uh, had higher motivation when they have the interaction with uh, students uh, and people from different countries. So I highly recommend those teachers uh, have join the or join the community and then uh, from the community we invite international perspective to be put in our uh, learning context so that our students are more uh, happy uh, knowing more uh, perspective from the other part of the, the world you know it's Thanks funny you brought up math and a lot of us and see if you get you agree with me or not we teach generally the way we were taught and i don't think that people realize and at least i didn't realize this until an embarrassingly short time ago we don't all teach math the same way <laughs> and you know if you think about the way you know how to add or subtract or multiply or divide you know how to do it because that's how you learned it but the idea that i might approach it differently that's just a bizarre concept. But Neil, you know, talking about how they do it in Finland or other countries, it may be that if you're open to learning how other people teach, you are a more effective educator. I mean, I will never forget that I was a geology major back in the day. And there was a concept called the hanging wall for um, fault zones and the way the, the fault moves. And my professor explained that to me 20 times. Didn't have a clue. Was at a bar not far from where I live right now with one of my friends who was a geology major. And he said, oh, this is what it does. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, it's just this. I'm like, we have, it, that's easy. And he said, yeah, it's really easy. I never understood why you couldn't get it. I'm like, well, because the way the person was teaching it didn't click in my brain. I, so, I think, I think the, the, the thing is, at the end of the day, it all boils down to simplicity, right? Uh, regardless of which country you teach in, uh, what you're teaching, what age group you're teaching, um, I think what is important for teachers to understand is that the instruction should be crystal clear and very, very simple. Uh, I think a lot of teachers, including me, when I was teaching, you know, sometimes we get carried away. We, we, we think that, you know, the more complicated we try to make it, uh, you know, it's better, but actually it's not. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very, very, very difficult to make things simple. In fact, it's more difficult to make things simpler than uh, to make them complicated. But having said that, I've got one more uh, follow-on question. Sorry, uh, ne panel. Nilesh, could I, could I answer your question yeah. as well? Because I have an yeah, experience yeah, I'd like to share. Uh, sure. uh, I, I was once involved in, in um, reviewing an innovation module that we have at the Polytechnic, and uh, I wanted to uh, make it a bit more refreshing. So a group of us went to Denmark to, uh, to study from a group of young startups uh, how, how they... How they Start a, how they, they conduct a, how they run a startup and what are the things they do, and uh, we we were very excited with the ideas that we got. But we are taking these ideas from a from a culture where failure is an option, 
and bringing back to Singapore where failure is not an option. So then how do we teach our students that, that it's okay to fail because if you want to be a startup, be prepared for failure. So we couldn't use what they taught us, lock, stock and barrel. We needed to adapt it. But we created a rubric where we put it into place. Okay, if you fail, what do you do to bounce back? And, and so students were not fearful of failing now because they knew there was an opportunity to redeem themselves. So to, to answer, you, you can't take the whole thing. You've got to adapt it to your culture. Uh, but you want them to become like the Danish, like the, the, the Finnish, then you've got to do some tweaking and you've got to be a, a very patient because it's not going to happen overnight. It may take one or two years. Right. Um, so I have one other follow-up question before we open up uh, the, the questions for the audience. Um, my follow-up question is basically uh, about um, cultural stereotypes. Um, you know, um, especially when you start looking at the younger generation, I mean, you know, everybody is connected to the internet these days. Um, they're all on Facebook, YouTube, uh, you know, they're watching videos from different countries. TikTok is huge. And again, TikTok is a global platform. Uh, so the younger generation is seeing what's happening in all these different countries. Hollywood movies, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, play a huge part in, in people's lives. Uh, you know, television shows, Netflix, so on and so forth. So my question is with, related to, you know, all these cultural stereotypes which are propagated through these various platforms. Um, you know, what advice would you give to teachers in order to in order for them to first unlearn a few things before they start really understanding you know what the you know various cultures are all about but first of course they need to unlearn a, a wide wide range of things so what advice would you give to teachers for that well, since I am a certified trainer in cultural intelligence, <laughs> I'll be able to answer that. Um, what, I will tell everyone, go and do a course or workshop on cultural intelligence. One of the first things you learn in cultural intelligence is to know yourself. You need to know uh, what are your uh, assumptions and stereotypes, what are your biases, because we all have conscious and unconscious biases. You need to unravel that. Once you're able to analyze yourself, you also they will then be able to analyze others. Then you need to study the various cultural dimensions because not every culture is the same. How people deal with uncertainty, how they handle power, how they uh, handle relationships, uh, how they communicate, how they, their attitude toward work and, and education is all different. So they, they need to, to, to understand that. But, but a course in cultural intelligence, the first thing they will learn is how to unlearn all the stereotypes they have and assumptions and, and how to compensate that with being empathetic. Once you, you are able to show empathy and put yourself in the shoes of the other person and think like the other person, then you will realize that many of his decisions or her decisions are impacted by their culture or their belief system. And then you'll be able to adapt and, and, and you'll be able to then make that, 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 that whole cultural experience more harmonious. Thanks for that. Uh, so Tirso, Park Ibam, uh, any, any additions to that? Thank you, uh, Neil. When talking about different culture, like you said, uh, stereotype, misunderstanding, cultural shock are the most common thing that um, our students sometimes they face in, in their uh, daily experiences. What we need to what we need uh, to do in our class. We need to uh, expose them to real situation. Say for example, in my class, uh, the majority of the students are from Indonesia. Some are international students. And uh, when they have interaction with the other international students, sometimes they got shocked because uh, they had a different culture. And sometimes when I uh, send the survey, sometimes they had like uh, stereotyping before, stereotype before. So we, what we need to do is uh, give them the exposure and then, um, um, and then ask our counterpart to share from their perspective. So uh, having a discussion, connecting our students into a real situation then they will, it will broaden their understanding. It will uh, eliminate uh, 
uh, stereotyping, misunderstanding, and then cross-culture shock. And of course, uh, before doing that, uh, uh, we need to uh, give them the schemata. We need to give them uh, what we call the overview, what are the other cultures are about. That's why uh, inviting um, other students, other lecturers, other teachers from the other perspective and ask them to share their opinions about our own culture and asking our students to share their opinion about the other cultures and put them together and and having a, like a friendly discussion so that it can reduce uh, cross-culture uh, what we call uh, shock and then it could also reduce uh, stereotyping that might be happening uh, among our students or among our teachers. Thank you. And maybe, uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, how to handle these things? Of course, uh, first fundamental, we already have individual differences before we come to our classroom. If we have 40 students in a class, of course, we have 40 different type of person. Mm -hmm. uh, how much more if we, ha if we have different uh, nationals in a classroom? So we, we really need to, because collaboration to me, uh, attached to collaboration is mutual recognition. Recognition. We have to recognize. Uh, we cannot impose ours to the others. So for them to behave maybe the same as what we are thinking them to do, uh, to, to be, we need to have a lot of immersion. You know why we behave like this? Because we were immersed in this country. We were immersed in this culture for quite some time. For us to harmonize them, there, it, it really needs more immersion, more time for them to be, should we say, acclimatized, for them to be in that culture. Hey, how can we do that in a span of one semester or a year? So it really takes some time. And while it is not happening, we need recognition. We need to recognize that, uh, let's say, in collaboration, best practices. We cannot say ours is a best practice. When, when we learn from them, I think I will go back to the sharing of uh, Dr. Im, that... Uh, when we collaborate, maybe we collaborate with those ahead of us, and we also collaborate with those we think is lagging behind us, so that we can we can also learn to adjust. You know? So that, that's my take on that, Nilesh. Thank you. In fact, uh, you talked about immersion. It kind of reminded me of the time where when I was uh, still with Singapore Polytechnic, and I remember we had a partnership with PASUG at that point, uh, Satirso. We used to do the Learning Express programs, if you remember where we would have uh, you know, students from Singapore fly over to Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, and all these other countries. Uh, and uh, you know, we would stay uh, there in a small community, uh, about uh, I think about 13 or 14 students from each, from each of the universities. And we would actually use design thinking to solve an urgent need for the community. And the one, one uh, incident uh, which I recall from, from that particular immersion trip is eventually we had a Singaporean boy who fell in love with a Filipino uh, girl. Uh, they had a long distance relationship and eventually now they are married. And um, the student is here now in Singapore living with, uh, with him and his family. So if, here you go. I mean, you're talking about cultural immersion. It's as immersive as it gets. And this would have never happened for that couple if it was not for the partnership between the various schools involved. involved and for us to bring the students and you know do these uh, joint projects uh, so yeah um, but anyway with that uh, i think uh, it's time for us to move into the audience questions uh, so we've got uh, a whole bunch of questions from the audience as always we have about 71 questions we don't have time to address all so what i'm going to do is very quickly uh, pick a few uh, which kind of uh, represent uh, uh, you know a certain number of questions um, and uh, I will put, put it to the panel. So the first question that I have is, uh, due to the pandemic, establishing collaboration and linkages with higher education uh, institutions across the globe is very much possible. How can higher education institutions that forge partnership ensure quality education and sustain their individual mandates and distinct brands? Anyone? Thank you, Neil, for the question. So now the time is online and the participants uh, joining this 
discussion are coming from different part of the world and a different level of education and schools. Number one is a community of learning. Community of teachers is a must. So for example, in my case, I have joined a group of WhatsApp, group of LinkedIn, um, Freejo, for example. And in that community, there are also teachers, faculty members from other universities, from other schools, and from other part of the globe. And it is a good idea if the teachers, whatever role uh, that the teacher have, whatever subject that they have, it is a very important if they open the doors for others. Sometimes uh, we are maybe shy and we are afraid if, for example, I want to invite Dr. Tirso, for example, to come to our school, is it possible for him to come? Is it okay if we invite him to come? Is it appropriate or not? So now the time for us to open our doors, to welcome any differences that might be uncomfortable for us, that may be strange for us, but we do not know whether there is uh, good or not, whether there is uh, uh, what we call um, a good way to improve our teaching or not. From my own perspective, learning is about trial trying to do anything to improve. And we do not know yet whether it is effective or not unless we try it first. So we try first, then we modify, try, modify, try, modify, try, modify, get new perspective from the others. Say, for example, we want to learn from Singapore, for example, school from Singapore, teacher from Singapore. We don't know yet whether the approach is effective or not. The approach can be effective to improve our quality of our teaching, mathematic education teaching. Maybe it's not effective. We do not know. But the underline is, the most important one is, we need to open our doors we need to open ourselves to be in maybe uh, in comfortable. We need to what we call step out into our comfort zone. Uh, maybe different style, different approach. That maybe we don't believe it at the first, but we do not know until we try it. So, and of course, in trying out a new thing in our class need a lot of work. We need to do it, revise it, do it, revise it, do it, revise it. And that's the process of, of our effort to meet the need of our students, to, to be a more a global citizen of our students so that they have uh, international communication skills, so that they are ready for global competitive uh, work in the future. And one of the key thing we need to prepare for our students is our students need to have uh, international uh, global communication for their future competitive uh, work. Thank you, Neil. I, I, Thanks, resonate with, I resonate with what Dr. Imam said. Uh, if, if you start to uh, put limits like branding and stuff uh, and you, you will just box yourself in and you won't be able to progress, you need to try. Uh, if you are working with a reputable uh, university and you found someone you can work with, wow, that that's great. And then you take it from there. But you know, you you build the relationship and you engage, and you'd be surprised all the wonderful things you'll learn. Uh, in, in our polytechnic, for example, um, we can't send our students for overseas internship or for for local internships. But because more companies are working online, we can send our students for virtual internships, and uh, we send them out there to work with companies. Some are good, some are not so good, but we learn. Uh, those that are not so good that don't seem to have anything to teach our students, we don't visit them again. But those who are good, we continue to build a relationship and, and engage with them and, and look for other ways to uh, mutually benefit. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Uh, so, Tirso, do you want to add anything to that before I can move to the next question? 
uh, maybe Nilesh, you move to the next question so that we can have more questions. Okay. Sure, absolutely. I can, I can respond to that, but next question I think is uh, sure. better to be answered also. So, so the next question that we have from the audience is, how did you establish a learner-centered culture by using teaching strategies that respond to learners' linguistic, cultural, socio-economic, and religious backgrounds? So, Actually, you want to start? yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the question also answered itself. <laughs> I learned certain culture by uh, using teaching strategies that respond. Actually, the first part is a question. The second part is the answer. Uh, by using strategies that respond to learners' linguistic, let's say, for example, I have a class of, uh, let's say, 40 students with, let's say, five nationals or five nationalities. Now. It depends maybe on the subject. If my subject is calculus, then uh, of course we have a specific rules of engagement. And uh, because in mathematics, we can easily teach things no? because uh, numbers can easily harmonize uh, all thoughts. No? But when I teach, let's say, for example, social science, if I teach maybe uh, a psychology or maybe a management class, a management subject, then I can have, or I should have a different approach. Knowing my audience, I should even know how to pose question, no? If, let's say, for example, uh, I have, uh, looking at the religious background, uh, if I have, let's say, a uh, Muslim, I have a Christian, and how, how should I use examples even? My example should be well chosen so that it will not hurt other audiences. It may not be hurting other audiences, but for, for, for the others, it may, it may uh, send a different signal. So really understanding the audience is very critical so that the teacher can adjust its example, can adjust the way he posed the question, and uh, can adjust even the way he, her, her, his, his expectation. Thank you. Great. Um, Andrew, Park Imam, uh, anything to add over there? For, for, uh, personally, what I do when I have a class filled with uh, students from different cultural backgrounds, and I'm getting them to do a, a project, collaborative project, I, I, I put them in groups. And I get them to sit down and come up with a contract. Among themselves, they will decide the do's and don'ts for that group. And if the, if the person does not commit to the contract, they can kick that person out and the person's got to go to find another group. That way, the students take ownership of the whole thing. And they, they, they also engage with one another. And they, they come up with their boundaries and things work out. I just facilitate. Can, can you repeat your question, Neil, please? The, the question is um, basically, uh, how did you establish a learner-centered culture by using teaching strategies that respond to learners' linguistic, cultural, socioeconomic, and religious backgrounds? Okay, that's also a different, uh, difficult question here. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm more on the support of experiential education you know, rather than um, um, giving the theoretical knowledge to our students. I'm a typical of teachers who really like to uh, give the opportunity to the students to have uh, hands-on learning experiences rather than uh, listening from me and then knowing the importance of uh, cultural differences, the different of uh, linguistical differences. So I, I like to give them the opportunity to do more, to do, to experience. That's from my perspective, uh, that's the way how the students learn. So they, they do something, they will learn something. Uh, we also, even though our university name is University of Islam Malang, but we have uh, students from uh, really different religious background. We have Hindu, we have Buddhism, we have Christian. And in our class, uh, it's very diverse uh, from different part of the world. And um, linguistical background also very diverse, culturally di very diverse. And um, I and my colleague uh, did a research about 
the cultural immersion of international students and uh, Indonesian students. And from that research, it's, uh, it's very interesting, like what Dr. Tirso said, the more students spend in the diverse area, the more cultural understanding they will have. So the more uh, duration that they have in the class, having interaction with different culture, uh, say for example, uh, we did a research uh, with uh, uh, international students uh, from uh, more than 40 countries in Indonesia. And interestingly, the more they lived in Indonesia, the longer they live in Indonesia, the longer they interact with different part of cultures, the more tolerant they are in responding to uh, cultural shock, in responding to uh, different uh, shocking experiences. So um, what I can do in my class is give my students more access to experience uncomfortable experiences. The more our students experience more uncomfortable experiences, the more tolerant they will be. Of course, uh, in this process of learning, uh, we need to, uh, what we call, guide them, supervise them, but at the same time, we give them the exposure to a different uh, uncomfortable zone that might be different from their own cultures. That's Niels, my answer. Thank you. Uh, we basically have time for just one more question from the audience. So, and uh, I will uh, appreciate it if all the panelists could give short and sweet answers to this one. Um, so this question is, what best practice do you think you have in your school or institution that you would love to share or teach to an educator from another country? That's a fabulous question. Yeah, it is. The best practice that our university uh, use is never shy to invite someone that you do not know to come to your institution and to share their perspective. Sometimes the, what we call the, the feeling of, what we call afraid, sometimes uh, stop our innovation, stop our openness to improve uh, the quality of uh, our education. And of course, there are competitions among universities, among schools. And sometimes when we collaborate with other institutions, other schools, we are afraid of losing because of that competition. But the best thing that I can learn is collaboration is the key to be competitive, not vice versa. Thank you, Neil. Thanks. Andrew, Dr. Tirso? Okay, uh, Neil, maybe uh, the question is broad. Uh, best practice, actually, there are different areas. Best practice in management, best practice in research, best practice in teaching and learning. Maybe this is a uh, simple sharing on the ambit of maybe uh, teaching and learning, no? on the perspective of uh, educator manager or uh, manager or in the perspective of leadership. On our side in Batanga State University, this is just recent you know, because of the pandemic. Our policy before uh, is closed you now, and we made it now a little open to even invite lecturers from other countries. Uh, I propose a policy to our board to allow lecturers from other countries. Of course, we need to even assess the rates that we are giving. Uh, using the rates that we have, uh, we found out that it's not at par with the rates that other uh, universities are giving the professors, so that has to be taken into account. And uh, good that our board was uh, were, was able to approve it, it was approved. And uh, in the past semesters, we are already engaging a number of foreign professors. And uh, because we would like to populate 
even uh, our uh, uh, we would we would like to populate our colleges in the university with different foreign professors so that there will be cross pollination of idea there will be collaboration i, I wish that these professors uh, i i told our deans to let's say give a peer uh, a peer professor for for every foreign lecture that we have so that they can interact they can and I, I told them to have a sort of even e fellowship with them so that they can share what they are practicing in their country. So we, we have that policy just recently uh, approved. And uh, good that uh, I have uh, received feedback that these uh, foreign professors are doing well. Because, you know, if you are teaching in another country, you need to do really uh, very well. No? <laughs> they are really good. They are already good. But you have to be uh, better. No? Because you are professing in their country. So if I myself will be teaching maybe in the country, I need to learn also their culture. And I need to adapt. So that's now is uh, starting to happen in our university. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, best practices in, in terms of international linkages? Well, uh, you know, the internet provides an opportunity to join many uh, international communities. And we, we do a lot of that with, 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 when it comes to technology. And what we do is we put uh, on these uh, platforms, what we have available, what is our IP, and then we invite uh, institutions or reputable institutions or research uh, institutions to come on board and say if they have something that they can complement uh, or piggyback on what we have, then we collaborate to make a bigger project and we come up with a new IP and then we, we, we promote it or we commercialize it. But the, the best part of that collaboration is getting to know them and engaging with them and, and bringing them together to us and our students benefit from the exchanges as well as the lecturer. So, yes. So, in a way, uh, I agree with Dr. Imam and, and President Tess. So, it's all about collaboration with the international community. Thank you, Andrew. And with that, I'll uh, get Kirsten back into the conversation uh, to uh, or round up this particular conversation. Kirsten? Thank you so much, Neil. Um, as usual, these seminars, or our webinars go so quickly, and it is time for us to ask each of you for your final thoughts. So I don't know who would like to go first. I will go first, Dr. Christian. Please. So uh, happy audience, wherever we are now, in what can country now, and what level of education we are. It is important for us all of us to improve the quality of our education and to improve our quality of education is by doing the partnership with our international partners for example in my class i invite students uh, 30 students from russia to join our class they sit in in our class they look at they join our class for free it's very interesting. So please join the Friju. That's a good uh, community of teachers platform. Not just joining, but please invite us, invite speakers from all over the world to come to sit down in your class virtually, to invite their students to join your class. And by having international community with us in our class, believe me, it will increase our professionalism. Why our best practices says from our university, by having international students joining with us, international teachers joining in your school, it will improve yourself. Oh, my, my, my students now is not just from my own country, but the other countries will look at the way how I teach. Then of course it will improve the way how I handle uh, my class and automatically it will increase the quality of our education that we deliver to our students. And it is very important, the quality of education to achieve it by international partnership like already stated in the sustainable development goals designed by the united nation that will be targeted to be achieved in 2030 so be brave to invite other people students teachers from the other parts of the world to be part of our our global family thank you 
Thank you so much. Okay, uh, following Dr. Uh, Imam's uh, thought on uh, sustainable development goals, really I subscribe to that, that we should be all conscious, all aware that we are really part of this sustainable development goals. Quality education is there. Uh, partnership with the goals is there. Now, uh, why quality education? Of course, this should lead to competitiveness. We all have to be competitive. And uh, going to competitiveness, we are teachers here. We are uh, learners here. Some of us are managers here. I always go back to the very basic of uh, meeting student outcomes. Uh, I always share our faculty that uh, whatever training that uh, we are doing in the university, teaching on online learning, teaching on uh, or training on new online tools, I always impress. Look at your intended learning outcomes of your course or of your subject and stick to that. It's now the role of the teacher to determine and how to meet the intended learning outcome per subject or per course. It doesn't matter what strategy you have because you have the academic freedom. It doesn't matter what, uh, what uh, approach do you have. Be sure you meet the intended learning outcome. It's not more on the number of assessment tasks. It's not more on the number of exams. It's on how well you meet the student outcomes. And after all, it contributes to the student outcomes of the entire programs and will lead to quality of education that we're aiming for towards competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Andrew. Um, as educators, we must realize that our students are going to eventually go out and work in, in the world. They're going to become global. They're going to be, become part of the global workforce. And that's, that's a reality. And so as educators, we must prepare our students for that. And we too should be equipped uh, with the, the skills, the right skills to, to guide our students in preparation for that. And the best way to do that is through experiential learning. We really need a platform uh, where we could come together for as a community of practice. And uh, as as, Fiju, as as Akadisha already has that international membership, it's about putting them together, putting all of you together purposefully so that you can engage with one another, build relationships, build uh, 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 international linkages and learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you all to the panelists. Um, I'm going to see if I can summarize this. I have lots and lots of scribbles and my handwriting is not good at four o'clock in the morning. Um, okay, let's be honest. It's not good at four o'clock in the afternoon either. I don't know why I think it better. Um, so some of the key takeaways that I am taking away from this are it's about collaboration, not competition. And when we work together and collaborate, we raise the bar for everyone. So it's not like if President Terso does a great job teaching his students, then my students suffer. No, if we're working together and he does a great job, it raises the bar for all of us, which I think is a really, really important thing. And don't be afraid. We get scared to be vulnerable, to admit that maybe we don't know anything or maybe we're not perfect, go ahead and put yourself out there. Be vulnerable to, and open to these collaborations. Be open to learning. Be patient. Understanding how other cultures work doesn't happen overnight. You're going to make mistakes. Your students are going to make mistakes. How do you handle that? What do you do next to make sure those collaborations are strong and being open and understanding when someone makes a mistake that you may not necessarily appreciate? What was the intent? Um, empathy is incredibly important when you're doing international collaborations. But the cross-pollinization of ideas, I think that was a brilliant way to put it, Dr. Tirso, um, is critically important. We only are going to make each other stronger and better and have your students collaborate as well. Create opportunities for them to go and meet and talk to people from around the globe in virtual spaces and hopefully someday in actual physical spaces. But be open. Collaboration is really the key and we do have the digital tools to do it. If you're scared of the digital tools, 
take time to learn. We can learn from everyone, those who are more advanced than we are and those who are not necessarily advanced as we are. That doesn't mean that they don't know things that we don't. Be open, take risks, be vulnerable, collaborate, listen. And there's a, just a myriad of opportunities out there. So yeah, I agree. Someone just posted the cross-pollination of ideas. I think that was a fabulous way to frame it. And thank you for that, Dr. Tierso. Um, thank you to all the people who have watched this. Um, we know that the semester, the school year is starting for most of you very, very soon. Breathe. It's not back to the way it was before the pandemic and it's not going back, but we've learned a lot. Breathe, enjoy your students, learn along with them, reach out to people and collaborate when you need some expertise. Um, I love that we can see what people are posting. This is so cool. And I just want to sincerely thank all the teachers and all the administrators out there for all the hard work that they do. Thank you for being a part of this. For those of you who are in my night time zone, thank you for getting up in the middle of the night with me. Um, we've really enjoyed it. And all I have to say is thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Neil. And everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Kristen, because this is like very early morning. Like at, I believe it is 4 p.m. in It Michigan. is 4.22 a.m. right now for me. Wow. <laughs> really appreciate that, Dr. Kristen. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you well, so thanks, much. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Kirsto. Really appreciate your time, uh, Park Imam and Andrew. Likewise, thank you very much. Uh, I think... Uh, all of us, uh, uh, not just here at Acad Asia, but uh, I, I, I would probably speak on behalf of all the audience as well. I think we are very honored um, to to have you on the panel today and to learn thank from you. the insights that you've shared. Uh, so thank you very much. And I hope that we can uh, you know, continue this collaboration sure. uh, and build on this dialogue uh, to see how we can actually help our teachers um, uh, leverage on the community that we've developed uh, so that they can also build their own international partnerships. Uh, ha having said that, uh, I would also like to inform all the uh, uh, participants today uh, that uh, if you are looking to uh, get your e-certificates, uh, you can complete the exit surveys. Uh, there is a link being provided to you as we speak. Uh, you should be able to see the link in Facebook, in YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Uh, once you complete your exit survey, uh, you should uh, receive your e-certificate uh, of attendance for this particular event. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would also uh, invite you to join us for the next virtual fireside chat, which is on the not on August 28th. It's on the 25th of August. Uh, it's a it's a typo there. It's the 25th of August. Uh, August 20th is my birthday. I'm not going to work on my birthday. So <laughs> <laughs> my wife will kill me. But uh, you're, anyway, you're, uh, you're going to be 36, are you? Um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> you don't even remember 36, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I had more hair for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's on the August. It's on August 25, uh, and the topic uh, we will be discussing at that point is bringing Ed back into Ed Tech. Uh, so that's going to be the next topic, uh, and uh, we will have uh, new panelists there, and I hope to see all of you uh, on uh, the 25th of August as well. Uh, and with that, thank you, everybody, once again. And uh, stay safe, wherever you are, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, um, and yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks again. Yeah. The global community of educators. Are you an educator who finds it difficult to engage the Gen Z learner? Are you finding it a challenge to make full use of technology for teaching and learning? Are you of the belief that good instructional design means that we need to upload text and presentation materials, videos and quizzes onto a learning management system? Or are you still teaching all your classes using video conferencing systems? If so, then Freeju is the place you should be at. Freeju is a community of educators by educators. Here, you can network with educators from all around the world, 
collaborate on projects, exchange ideas, access the best competency-based professional development courses which help you enhance your pedagogical and technical skills as a 21st century educator. Learn to use digital tools which enable you to design your lessons easily and quickly and so much more. Join more than 100,000 educators from more than 35 countries and get access to a wide variety of competency-based professional development courses which you can complete at your own time and at your own pace. What's more, the courses are available in several different languages and come with CPD units and certificates. No matter if you teach children at a preschool or an elementary level or at a high school or tertiary education level, even if you are a corporate trainer training adults, we have professional development courses for you. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for early access to Freeju version 2 today at acatasia.com and get in queue to receive a free lifetime membership for Freeju. What's more, if you sign up today, you will even receive access to 10 professional development programs for free. Sign up today. Visit www.acatasia.com and join Freeju, the global community of educators.